Way up north, there is a mysterious island where vast areas of land are covered with perpetual ice. Iceland. Its landscape is rugged and torn by huge volcanoes and mighty waterfalls. A few years ago, 14% of Iceland's landmass was turned into a national park, the biggest in Europe. It has a heart of ice, the Vatnajökull National Park. a reconnaissance flight over the perpetual ice of the Vatna Yukul Glacier. It's Magnus Thomas' job to monitor the biggest glacier in Europe every four weeks, as most volcanoes are located here, deep below the ice, and nobody knows when the next eruption may occur. So being a, a pilot in Iceland is actually uh, quite interesting. Uh, I, I th think we have the best office view in, in the world and um, you always see something uh, new, for example, and, uh, and uh, it's challenging also. We have uh, a lot of uh, uncontrolled uh, area and, um, and it's, uh, the weather is challenging of course, uh, can change in, uh, in five minutes, so you always have to be very, very uh, well prepared your weather briefings. The ice of the Vatna Yokel is up to 1,000 meters thick. Often you can only see from the air if volcanoes are starting to spit fire under the glacier. Now with these flights that we're doing, uh, we do this about approximately uh, every month to get, uh, but get pictures of the area and, uh, and uh, the, uh, I would say, uh, Maybe the uh, most challenging part is always getting in the right position. The photos of the volcanic systems need to be taken from the same direction in order to be comparable. Job done, but the way back can also be quite perilous as the warm layers of lava can cause changes in the thermal updraft. Dangerous to fly over it because of the uh, warm air rising up from it, and uh, it caused a lot of turbulence. So we always, uh, we pilots, try to uh, avoid go going directly over it. On average, five volcanoes erupt on Iceland per year. The last eruption took place two years ago it's hard to tell which of the volcanoes will be next. Magnus Toma grew up near Reykjavik, Iceland's capital. As a child, he saw the impact of the forces that are released during the eruption of a volcano. His colleagues from Reykjavik University will analyze the photos he took. So now we're uploading the pictures to the university and uh, hope that they, uh, they came out really good. Iceland is located near the Arctic Circle and is the biggest volcano island in the world. In 2008, the biggest national park in Europe was created here around the Vatnajökull Glacier. It has a size of 14,000 square kilometers. On its northern border are the great plains of the Askia volcanic system.
Volcanologists from Reykjavik University, headed by renowned geologist Freistein Sigmundsen, are here to determine if a new eruption of the Askia is imminent. The volcanoes in the Vatnajökull National Park, they, they tend to, to be quiet for uh, many decades and then they erupt once in a while, so there can be long period of dormancy. Uh, they are quite different. We can have very explosive eruptions with tephra fall or ash plume that spreads over large distance, or we can have lava flows. And uh, the eruption in 2014 produced this very huge uh, lava flow. We are maybe worried that an explosive eruption could have more influence on people in Europe because of the ash plume that can travel a long distance. Big volcanic eruptions aren't only a threat for Iceland and air travel. They could cause climate changes and destroy whole harvests in Europe. This is a leveling rod to do the leveling observations. We will place it on, on benchmarks and then we can measure accurately the elevation difference between two sides. They work inside the caldera of the Askia volcano, which erupted in 1961 for the last time. to measure the pressure inside the volcano. Has it changed? Is the pressure increasing? Is there magma flowing into the volcano? And we can do that by measuring the elevation difference uh, precisely between set of stations. And the idea is that if there is new magma that comes in, then the volcano will inflate like a balloon. It goes up. And we can measure it with this technique with an accuracy of uh, better than one millimeter, so it's very precise. So if one side moves upward, an eruption is imminent. The cooled lava is brittle. There are many deep fissures in the ground. After an eruption in 1875, a lake built inside the big caldera. They need to hike for a few hours in order to reach the next measuring location. This is a dangerous place here. Two years ago, there was a, a major rock slide uh, collapse of material into the lake, creating a huge wave tsunami that came on land here uh, reached an elevation of 30 meters above the, the uh, lake uh, level, so it was catastrophic, but luckily no one was here. Life on Iceland is influenced by shifts in the weather and the ground. The first measurements are done. Now the geologists only need to reach their base camp in the middle of the volcanic area. This hut is one of the very few locations in the national park where you can find refuge. Nobody was here for a whole year, as it is only used for doing the measurements. So it's a, it's a small hut, but it is good, good shelter. Um, and it can be very windy, lots of rain, cold. It can snow during the summertime, but this is a good base. The geologists immediately start their analysis of the data, 
What's the ASCIA system status? So we have discovered that ASCIA is deflating, it is subsiding slightly by uh, up to a few centimeters. Uh, this signifies pressure decrease in the roots of the volcano. Uh, it means that there is no inflow of new magma into the volcano. Things are safe, things are stable here. So we will now focus our attention on, on Pardarbunka, the subglacial volcano of main interest. Uh, that is where we need to monitor and try to understand what will happen in the future. But the geologists decide to rest a little before their next destination, Badabunga, the neighboring volcano. Even at the height of summer, temperatures may drop below zero out there. After a day like this, what we have experienced, amazing landscape, um, uh, forces of nature, and being able to to carry out high-level scientific research at the same time, that's very unique. And being with good friends in the highlands of Iceland, that is really great. The rivers from the volcanic area swell more and more on their way to the Arctic Sea, turning the coastal strip of this otherwise barren island deep green. The most famous animals of the island live on this pasture, the Icelandic horses. The two Germans, Jasmina and Katarina, work at the Hornhester farm. When the Vikings built their settlements in Iceland, the horses they brought here were their biggest helpers in this rugged and forbidding land. They are still considered beings that connect man with the gods. Purebred Icelandic horses are very much sought after and are traded internationally. In Iceland, there is even a university for horse breeding. I had worked here for a year and then applied to study at the university in Hola. I studied there for a year, and the second year there starts in August. I only arrived here four days ago, but I'm planning the same. Omar Omason is the owner of the farm and one of the biggest horse breeders in Iceland. The most important thing for us is the character of our horses. They are friendly and easy to handle. They are consistent, but still sensitive and wild. And of course, they've got a great temper. Right, now I've got a new job for you. Ride over the land and check all the horses and foals to see if they're healthy. Mostly during the year, the horses of the farm live in the wild, but sometimes their well-being needs to be monitored. Quite often, nobody really knows where they are, and it's a long way to their pastures. The young women can't ride through the rough terrain for more than two hours, though. It's important to rest once in a while. They love their horses, but they also grew fond of the people here. The people here are quite confident. They often do whatever they like. That's the beauty of it all. If they like to go riding, they just do it. And they're generally very easygoing. 
The days are long during the summer in Iceland. But if Yasmina and Katarina don't succeed in finding the horses soon, they need to turn back, as there is no way of spending the night out here. Finally, they spot the herd. Are the animals in good health? Of course they can get injured and hurt their legs with all the rocky terrain. And there are hierarchic encounters as well. But the most common injuries out here in the wild are on their legs. In order to properly check the horse's well-being, they need to get closer. The horses enjoy their freedom around here. In Germany, we also try to allow our young horses as much freedom as possible on the biggest possible pastures. But it's a really big difference compared to the distances here. We rode for hours in order to look after them. They appear to be fine, they all seem healthy, and they all eat well. Nothing to worry about. Not far from the horses' pastures, Iceland's rugged mountains reach up to the sky. Helga Anna Dottir works as a ranger in the south of the national park. What I think of this uh, special about Wagner National Park is this combination of forces that are creating the uh, the variety of landscape features we have. So these forces are uh, geothermal activity, volcanoes, earthquakes, uh, and glaciers. She is especially interested in glaciers, as they melted more rapidly during the past few years. Now she checks on Hoffelsjökull, one of the big glacier tongues in the south. And you can see the gravel in front of it. You don't see much vegetation on the gravel. So we say, oh, it's quite, it's not such a long time since there has been either a lake or a glacier there. Here the ice seems to be melting faster too. Helga Anadotia takes notes of the coordinates in order to compare the changes. There always were two rivers on either side of this mountain, but now it's only one. And what we see is just an empty passage of a glacier river. But what does that mean? Is there less ice melting or did the water find another passageway? The cold trace leads her to Iceland's biggest glacier lagoon, the Jukulsalon. Here, Helga wants to find out how much of the glacier has melted away. biggest glacier lake in Iceland and the reason for the lake for the reason for this area is because all the dramatic changes that are going on uh, we should this is not this has not always been like this uh, we have photos and measurements and around like during 1930 there was a glacier where we are now but why does the Vatnajökull melt is it due to global warming or because there is an active volcano under the ice. 
but volcanic activity, of course. There are a lot of volcanoes, active volcanoes underneath Vatnajökull glacier. Uh, and when there is an eruption underneath, of course, it's a, there's a fire, there's a, and they are melting the ice underneath the, the glacier. Around 8,000 square kilometers of land are covered by the Vatnajökull's ice. But Europe's largest glacier has been dwindling faster and faster in the past 100 years. I'm collecting data, I'm taking photos when I'm at work and I go closer to the glacier, of course I take photos and I try to take leaf point to see, okay, this is where I am today and just collect because we know the changes are happening so fast and we just want to get those information where the glacier is from time to time. Helga hopes that her data will be of help for finding the cause for the melting ice. But one thing is certain, it does melt. And so the millennia-old ice slowly drifts into the North Atlantic to thaw. Iceland's glaciers are majestic, still. Not only the rangers and scientists are fascinated by the ice. German Henry Paul Wolf is training for his exam as a glacier guide. Denny Matson from Sweden is his coach today. All right, so Fatjaket is the glacier, and it means translates into falling glacier. And what's cool about this one that is pretty unique is that it has one active part, which is the upper section, and one passive part, which is the lower section. Henry originates from Berlin and has been working as a tourist guide on the island for eight years now. The exams to become a certified glacier guide are tough. Today, it's his last training tour before the exam. It's much harder to walk up there than down here. There are quite flat plateaus below. With climbing irons, we can walk almost like on regular ground, but in the rugged areas up there, there are many crevices in the ice that are almost invisible and therefore very dangerous. Up there, you can only walk on marked tracks. Without an experienced glacier guide, it's a bad idea to do otherwise. Vatnajökull's glacier tongues are unpredictable. It thaws in certain places, which results in deep crevices. One misstep, and you could fall into the abyss. These glaciers seem both impressive and perilous to me. You can see how deep the crevices go down if you get close enough. It's quite something. But the biggest threat can be the weather, as it changes nowhere faster than in Iceland. Okay, Henry, so what we're going to do now is going to practice set up a hand line. It's a way to make it easier for the groups to travel down and up steeper sections of the glacier. So what I want you to do is go up there, set up a hand line with some handholds, the Alpine butterfly that I know you know, and then we'll show, we'll actually uh, use the hand line for going up as well. Denny Madsen checks the safety leash. It's all good. But then the weather changes. Right. 
what brought the German to the Icelandic wilderness. I spend much more time in nature than I did in Germany, and I've grown very fond of it. I didn't have any of this before. I worked in an office, grew up in the city, and never came into contact with something like this. When I first came here, it instantly felt like home, and that was such a strong feeling that I wanted to live here. The most important discipline for a glacier guide is climbing up an ice wall. Okay, so welcome to the wall. This is our challenge for the day. We're going to climb this one. We have this beautiful waterfall to our right. Uh, ice climbing is all about footwork, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm sure you'll be fine climbing this wall. If you haven't worked at a glacier for a while, you may get out of practice, especially if you don't practice your knots and work with ropes. It needs regular practice. I haven't done it for quite some time, that's why we're about to train that now. It's the nuts and bolts of working at a glacier, because our life or the life of our clients depends on it. We can't risk our own lives or the lives of others. Better safe than sorry. Put the rope in and it's quite uh, nicely done here. You have two pictures on the ATC. You have one hand that should go down to your delay hand and then the climber should go up to the anchor and then down to the climber. During the exam, this part especially mustn't go wrong. You could easily lose your footing here. That's what this safety rope is for. Henry still has some time left for training before his exam. 12% of Iceland's landmass are covered by glaciers, and there are volcanoes below that left big gaps in the land throughout the past centuries. But even the most rugged volcanic landscape eventually turns green again, as we can see at the northern border of Vatnajökull National Park. For many years, Brindis Pitosdottir has been living here with her family and other beings that the Icelanders call Huldufolk, the hidden people. I just want to uh, bring a gift from my home to the hidden people where we are going to make a connection to them. And they would like that I had make an effort for some contact. Believing in elves and trolls is quite common amongst the Icelanders. Sometimes roads make a turn without any apparent sense. They were built around elven territory. Today, Brindis visits a magical place, the valley of Vesturalua. The elves and the hidden people, they live around here. And they like uh, the blend of the green areas and the rocks and the stones. So that is a contrast what they like because that uh, gives them opportunity to 
live in the camouflage of the nature, so they don't stand out so much. It is rumoured that around 80% of Iceland's population believe in the existence of elves, trolls and hidden beings. This is a very typical scenery of uh, where the Hultefolk is living. And uh, both the stones and the grass and the trees together. And you can see this in many places in Iceland, very typical. And there are, here are three families living together and they are all as uh, farmers. And uh, they have a big families, like uh, eight children, and nine children. This belief is deeply rooted in the land's myths. It's a holy realm, the Kyakyan, the elven cathedral. They're not good for you for a long time. I would never put a stone like this in my pocket, no. But it's, uh, it's good in small amounts. It's in, uh, in belief in Iceland, if you put a stone like this in front of your house, it, it keeps thieves away. So it's a, it's a massive energy, but it's both good and bad, you know. Uh, you can balance a little bit of, uh, if it's uh, coming a lot of energy from crack mm -hmm. underground, you can balance it by putting this kind of stone. Over millennia, the river that is fed by the Vanajökull glacier has eaten its way deep into the rock, forming a canyon. And similar to humans, the hidden people settled alongside its walls. Only people like Brindis can see them. The hidden people look just like us. Uh, women and, and men and children, boys and girls. And they just dress. You can see the differences in their dresses. They dressed like maybe three, four hundred years ago. And the girls always wear dresses, not pants. And uh, yeah, they live a very simple s farm life. The belief in those mythical creatures is connected with the deep belief in the forces of nature. And according to Brindis, this force can be felt nowhere better than at the Detifoss, Europe's biggest waterfall. Do the elves and the hidden people have a stronger connection with nature? Do they feel the dangers it may induce? I think if there would be eruption or volcanic activity, uh, you ha would have to be uh, the elves and hidden people friends or have been in contact with them before if you are supposed to be, uh, uh, let's say, get a notice before. They don't go and ask, they tell you without any connection. But they usually don't want to inf interfere because we have our own life and they have their own life. But uh, they would maybe sneak into your dreams and tell you to be prepared that something is going to happen. The untamed power of water and the volcanoes pose a permanent threat to Iceland but they are also a big opportunity for its inhabitants. For many years, they have been producing energy from natural sources. Mm -hmm. 
Huge power plants were set up near the national park using the hot steam from volcanic depths. Big reservoirs provide power plants with water. At the eastern border of the national park, a power plant was built with tunnels that were 80 kilometers long. Arne Odenson was there when the structure was built. I think it has changed a lot. Before, people relied on fishing, that was the main industry, and it is still a uh, uh, very important industry in the area. But with the smelter and this station here that provides the energy for the smelter, I think there are about 700 or 800 people that are working directly or indirectly for, for this industry. Many jobs were created, but there was also criticism about the impact the projects had on nature. Andy Odenson has to make sure that the power plant is safe for the environment and that it works without any problems. One of the turbines isn't fed with water. Well, normally there would be water in this channel here, but right now there is some maintenance work going on inside this house, and I think we should just go and check out what is going on there. The Karayuka power plant is one of the biggest water power plants in Europe. Water from several reservoirs feeds the canals that lead to the power plant. The floodgates of the canals are under steady pressure and require constant maintenance. In the spring and early summer, when the water level in, in Hallstrom Reservoir is low, we get a lot of runoff water from this area, a lot of snow in this area. So when the spring comes, and then get a lot of water in this area. So it's very really important for us, in the spring especially. Then the floodgates are opened again. Over a decline of 600 meters, the water rushes in direction of the power plant. Arne Odinson needs to go back into the mountain. It's an 11 kilometer drive through the tunnel to get to the core of the power plant, where the turbines are propelled by the water. The total capacity of this station is 690 megawatts. And really it all starts up in the glacier, in Vatnajökull Glacier. Water, ice and fire determine the life on this volcanic island near the Arctic Circle. It's a new day at work for volcano pilot Magnus Thoma at the airfield of Mivatten. So it's really nice uh, to have the first time coming on board. It's nice to see him again. Of course, a really famous geologist. Like every month, Magnus Thoma prepares his Cessna for his exploration flight over the volcanoes that hide below the glaciers. The weather couldn't be better. Freistein Sigmundsen is a professor for geology at Reykjavik University and one of the leading volcanologists in the world. Oh, hi. Nice to see you again. Good. So, for this, for this trip, I, I, I thought inspired to tell you. 
so uh, I want to fly here from the north. I want to fly uh, towards the Aska volcano to look for chances, in particular at the lake here. Mm -hmm. uh, any overall chances in the volcanic zone? If we go further south, I want to look for the Bárðarpunga volcano. Mm -hmm. Uh, there have been some more earthquakes, so we want to see if we can see anything unusual from the earth. First, he returns to the huge Askia volcanic system, which he recently monitored. He is convinced that only steady monitoring of the volcanic activities will lead to a fairly precise prediction of eruptions. The crater of Askia is 100 kilometers away. The immense size of this volcano can be observed best from the air. The scientists set course to the currently most dangerous volcano, the Badabunga. It erupted in 2014, but the geologist fears a much bigger eruption. Freistein Zygmundsen and his team have determined a volcano with a crater size of 80 square kilometers under the ice of the Vatnajökull. We are looking for chances in the ice. It is fully ice covered. So here we are looking for ice cauldrons or subsidence on the ice. Uh, evidence for new geothermal activity under the ice. That can mean uh, new heating of the volcano or magma moments like that. But at the moment, the Badabunga seems to sleep peacefully under the ice. inside these volcanoes. I, as a scientist, I'm interested in trying to understand these magma movements and have been devoting my career to that uh, kind of research. At the same time, it is very beneficial for uh, all public here in Iceland and Europe and the world to, to know what is going on. Because when the next eruption happens under the ice, it will have a catastrophic effect. Freistein Zygmundsen and his team cannot prevent such a huge eruption under the glacier's ice, but they are getting closer and closer in regards to a precise prediction. Uh, 